Okay, so as a start, can you just say and spell your name, please? Sure. Mark Walsh, M-A-R-K-W-A-L-S-H. Okay. And uh, t to get us going, could you just give me a... Uh, autobiographical sketch. You can be as elaborate as you'd like, but basically, you know, where you're from, uh, where you've been, what you've done, what you're doing now. Sure. I grew up in Westerly, Rhode Island, which is a, a little town in, uh, in southeastern Rhode Island, right on the Connecticut border. Um, after high school, I went to school in New Haven, Southern Connecticut State University. I went there uh, because I, I could afford it. My parents didn't have a lot of money, and I had saved up some money working in high school. Um, after college, uh, I did a little work on a congressional campaign in Connecticut, and I did some uh, some writing. I, I at one point wanted to be a journalist, but then that kind of fell apart. I decided that uh, that wasn't for me. So a friend of the family was uh, had her own public relations firm that she was starting. She'd been work she'd worked as a diplomat. She'd worked uh, for tourist boards in the travel industry and at Graycom. Had her own small agency. She said, you, you can write, you, uh, you, you enjoy doing this stuff in politics, so public relations is kind of a combination of the two. Why don't you come and work for me? This would have been 1987, I believe. So I moved from uh, New Haven, where I'd been living after uh, college, to New York in 1987, and uh, started uh, working in PR. I... Uh, uh, enjoyed it a great deal. Like I remember the first week I was working, we, we had to deal with the hurricane. Uh, one of our clients was the Caribbean Tourism Organization, so it was sort of like practically sleeping in the office. And it was, very, it was but it was very exciting to me because it was my first, you know, real sort of communications job. And that was my major in, in college. I was a communications major. Um, so I got I got kind of hooked there, and I liked the traveling aspect of being in uh, the tourism industry, and did that uh, for three different companies. Uh, over the next uh, 20 years or so, until 2008. Uh, by 2008, I was uh, running uh, the New York office of a Baltimore-based public relations agency called TBC. Um, I uh, was at a level sort of like just below the senior vice president level. And I had never really, uh, you know, we'll get, get into this later if, if we need to, but I had never really... Um, pushed to get too far in the company. I liked the level I was at, I liked what I was doing. So I was essentially kind of upper middle management, um, which in retrospect was a, was a mistake to stay there, <laughs> obviously. How big, how big a company is this? Uh, it, in Baltimore they had, uh, I think about 70 people, but the New York office, uh, when I started there, was about 15 people. Mm -hmm. and by the time I left, after with layoffs and things, it, it was only a couple of us. Um, so uh, in 2008, the company lost a lot of business uh, on the advertising side. Is this still tourism? Or I was doing mostly uh, a lot of tourism, but we also had clients like CBS. They're, they're, they're in drugstore clinics, and I, I worked for everything from... When you're in a PR agency, you do whatever clients the, the agency can get. Mm -hmm. And since they were also advertising, sometimes they'd get advertising clients in something wacky and they throw in the PR as an adjunct, so you'd have to learn about something really quick. And that was, that was actually part of the fun of the business for me. You know, suddenly you're doing like, a, I had to do like a, a vitamin supplement, never worked on it before, but you know, we got the client, so the next day you have to be an expert about it and write a, write a program on how to promote it. Um, so yeah, but primarily I was a tourism expert, and I, I worked for clients uh, in the Caribbean, in Mexico, and when I was with TBC, we worked for Niagara Falls on the U.S. side, Singapore, several uh, big hotel chains across the U.S., and, um, and, and I really enjoyed it. But in uh, 2008, they lost a ton of business, and they had to close the New York office. They offered me the chance to move to Baltimore, but I, had, at that point, I was, uh, gosh, I guess I was 46 years old. I had a life here. I was, uh, you know, I was living with my girlfriend. Uh, we had an apartment that we really loved, and I liked being in New York. I was really, I was hooked on it. I didn't want to move to Baltimore. Um, and then uh, started looking for a job, and now it's 2012, and I'm just kind of consulting wherever I can get a, a, a project during the day and I'm bartending at night at a little place called Elizabeth's on the west side of Manhattan um, and still kind of wondering you know what happened I'm, I'm almost 50 years old and uh, kind of just figured I'd be a, a white collar uh, exec for the rest of my life and now I'm uh, uh, just a little puzzled at what happened. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the, the industry in general, but then also your view of it, just as the crash was coming. First of all, how much, um, how how much warning was there that this was coming down the pike? Um, 
Uh, quite a bit. Uh, again, you know, you do a lot of looking back when you're in my position, and a lot of uh, you have a lot of regrets. I, I, I knew what was coming, and I knew I, I did know that I'd be one of the last people let go because I was uh, I'd been there for a long time. I'd been there for five years, which is pretty long in the industry, and I was kind of running the office. But they laid off nearly everyone but myself and two other people by by the end. And and there was plenty of uh, in the last six months, it was very clear that something was going to happen. I just foolishly thought that with my experience, I'd, I'd have a, a much easier time uh, getting a job. I didn't start to seriously look for a job until the last few months of my employment at TBC, mm -hmm. and that's when I realized, you know, how, how bad things have gotten. Right. And when did that industry take the hit in relationship to? I mean, you know, I think in this town, the 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 headlines about the financial institutions in September 08 were kind of the marker for everybody. When yeah. when did your industry really take the hit in relation to that? Was it like soon after? Was it around the same time? Was it? It, uh, it was both because uh, you have existing contracts that wouldn't expire till the end of the year depending on when they were started. So uh, a lot of people didn't renew. Um, my company uh, you know, advertising and PR is often the first thing to go. It's not bottom line stuff. It's not mm -hmm. manufacturing. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, so it's image stuff. So uh, as soon as that started happening, we all knew that that things were going to, you know, that clients were going to retrench and uh, uh, and that contracts were going to be either cut short or not renewed. So yeah, I, I knew things were getting really bad probably in, in summer of two thousand eight, mm -hmm. and that I knew that it was coming. I didn't know how bad it would get, mm -hmm. but I. I uh, um, yeah, that, that's when, and that's when everybody started. And I started to see all of my friends being either laid off or, or friends uh, in the industry. Yeah, in public relations and advertising, communications and marketing. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so it, yeah, it was that summer I started to sense things were going to go bad, and then by that winter, certainly by December, I, I knew that I wasn't long for this world. Mm -hmm. What's your sense of what's been happening in the industry over the last four years? I mean, it's interesting what you're saying about manufacturing because. The other side of that coin would seem to me to be that, like, there are a lot of jobs that were lost in other sectors of the economy that are probably never coming back. But this would seem to be a sector that that will come back. Um, but how, does think, that, how does that look to you? I, well, I think that's partly true. Um, the the problem uh, is that the industry is changing so quickly. Um, the model that existed. Four years ago, uh, when I uh, five years ago now, when I lost my job, doesn't exist anymore. Um, nobody cares if you have great contacts at the New York Times or at the Wall Street Journal. Everybody wants to know if you have access to the most important bloggers and the most influential mm. online sources. Uh, can you, you know, update a Facebook page to 30 times a day? And and uh, just social media is changing communications and marketing so quickly that it's never going to come back to where it was in the way that it that it was. Right. Um, and that also requires uh, people at a, at a, uh, a lesser level, a, a ju more junior level. You know, someone like me, uh, I'm, I'm certainly good at doing proposals and sort of higher level strategy stuff, but there's less of a need for that when um, you really need folks who are very comfortable with, with, with social media to go in and, and, and uh, uh, you know, do the kind of stuff that people who are my age do. Uh, are not are not as comfortable with, or, mm -hmm. or it doesn't come as naturally to us, or at least that's the perception in the industry. Right. So it comes it's coming back. I think it's coming back um, uh, with a lot less people involved mm -hmm. and, and, and people at a much more junior level, um, and in a, in a much different form. You know, traditional taking journalists out to lunch PR is has gone the way of of, uh, of, of you know, the dodo. It's just mm -hmm. not there anymore. Now it's all about squeezing a lot of hours out of your junior level people to to hit social media because mm -hmm. the influences are changing constantly. Right. You know, nobody really cares about the print media as much as they care about uh, getting keeping people's attention in that kind of uh, social media environment. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, the Holy Grail used to be a New York Times piece. It's not anymore. It's right. it's, it's different online influencers. Mm -hmm. Did you say they closed they closed the New York office entirely, or there's still some? No, they closed it entirely. They closed it entirely. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. um, do you want to talk a little bit about bartending? Sure. Because, I mean, looking at the world from behind a bar, you get a particular view of, of life. And this is the Upper West Side. I'm sure things look different uh, in other parts of the city. But I'm wondering, can you talk about this this period that we're in? You know, economically, politically, all, um, what what it looks like from, from behind the bar and the kind of people that you're 
engaged with and talking to every night, you know, just the kind of random folks who come in. Um, what's your sense of, of, you know, what the world looks like right now? That, that's interesting because of, of, of where we are, you know, what we are in a very particular location. Um, though we, we do get, because we have a sister restaurant next door that's a, a Mexican restaurant, we get, we get a lot of different types of people go there. It's, everybody loves Mexican food, no matter what your, your, wherever you live, where, where you live or what your class. Um, so uh, I get a lot of uh, a lot of different folks coming in. There's a lot of insecurity out there. I definitely sense there's a lot of anger out there. Um, I, I, I may have mentioned to you before that, that we've had, in, in recent days, the politics have been in the news, the conventions and the debates and everything else. And I can't put anything on the television, uh, even if customers at the bar request it, that has to do with politics with the sound of without somebody getting really, really worked up and angry from one side or the other. That, you know, when I did bartending to put myself through college in the 80s, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. um, there's just this lack of uh, a, uh, an ability to listen to other people's voices or, or a willingness to hear other points of view. I mean, and I think that's probably connected to the way we're all, you know, tunneling our information now and only getting the stuff that... Um, that we want to hear. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true with customers as well. Uh, increasingly, um, you know, there are many ex great exceptions, but increasingly uh, I'm seeing people, uh, especially folks, you know, that we in the industry call suits, people who clearly are of means, maybe they have a really nice credit card and a, and a lovely clothes on, who have zero patience for like the normal everyday idiosyncrasies that, that have to do with, with life, with eating in a restaurant, with with having to wait for your food or not having a particular wine that you want. Mm -hmm. It just feels very much to me like, uh, compared to when I did this a while ago, there, there's less patience. Um, and it kind of a, I think there's kind of a resentment, too, uh, at least among the kind of Upper West Side, uh, I guess money is the only way to put it, folks who, who, who I uh, see in the bar, um, that there's just an antagonism between uh, the, the folks who are serving you uh, and the folks who are being served mm -hmm. that, that I, I don't remember. There, there's, there's no sense of like uh, noblesse oblige, if you want to call it that. There's a sense of uh, we resent you and you resent us and let's just quit pretending that everything's okay. Huh. Maybe and, that, and you see that going, you feel that coming in your direction from them. Yeah. You don't see it going the other direction. Oh, I'm sure it does as well. I mean, um, and, and uh, yeah, I, I hear it from the people I work with. There's there's definitely a, a sense of that, you know, the 90, 99% against the 1%. Uh -huh. um, and I, I have a lot of folks come in and out of the restaurant business who are laid off from real estate, laid off from, from Wall Street, laid off from various things, and they're not happy to be there. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of resentment uh, at, at the folks who they see took down the structure that, that they were hanging on to, you know. I feel it. I certainly mm -hmm. feel it. Has that sense of antagonism intensified over the years that you've been Absolutely, here? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think it's so. getting worse and worse. I, yeah, I don't think uh, it's getting better as, you know, 2008 recedes into the background. I think it's kind of entrenching itself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, uh, anger is, is out there. Anger, resentment, and a kind of like a, a scrabbling for the pieces that are left, you know? Uh -huh. Do you think that that is peculiar to New York? Be just because of because of the, the people from the financial industry who, who populate the city and um, and just kind of what the history of that is and who they are and uh, or would you expect to find some version of that in other places as well I can't believe it's it's just a New York phenomenon I mean I've lived here almost exclusively for over 20 years so it's hard for me to really get a feel for what's happening in other places, but talking to my friends, um, uh, there's definitely more uh, touchiness out there. At least mm -hmm. people, I'm always keeping in touch with people who work in the industry, in, in the industries I'm interested in in other cities. And um, th there's, I guess that comes with the insecurity of, of, of seeing what had happened um, in 2008. And, and everybody has friends who are still out of work after five or six years. You know, I'm underemployed after six years, but I know people who are still completely unemployed. Mm -hmm. I have people in my in the building I, I live in across town who, uh, one's a reporter, the other one worked uh, as in, in sales, and they're both still unemployed after uh, 2008, except one's working part-time. But um, yeah, and they're, when I run into them in the laundry room, they're angry. They're angry at the 1%, if you will. They're angry at the system that seems to be rigged against them. And um, 
again, they're both sort of in their 40s, 30s. They didn't expect to be here like me. Um, they thought if you played by the rules and, and you did everything right and you worked hard and um, you got a lot of experience at something and you devoted yourself to a company and you, uh, you'd have some security and you, you wouldn't be told, here's three weeks severance, you know, get your ass out the door. Uh, and then, you know, go on 40 or 50 interviews like I did and have uh, people kind of wince when you come in the door and they see that you're in your late 40s. It's, uh, they didn't expect that or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, that's the feeling I get. I mean, I have this, maybe I'm projecting some of that in, into, into what I overhear at the bar. Maybe that's the stuff that catches my attention, um, to be fair. But uh, there just seems to be a lot of talk about what we're going to do, um, how things are collapsing, uh, or or the flip side of uh, can you believe what these these uh, uh, these stupid jerks are trying to do from one side or the other? Just not a focus on solutions, but a lot of blaming, and, it, and both ways, both ways. Mm -hmm. I've had I've certainly had customers who are. You know, in the one percent, if you will, of the people who uh, are very successful Upper West uh, Siders, uh, talking about uh, the hippies and the and the, and the how the unions are destroying America and how everybody wants uh, to be taken care of and coddled, like you know, kind of. Uh, it didn't surprise me at all when Mitt Romney made that forty-seven percent comment, because because I overhear that with with people who uh, clearly and and. and it, it, it always astonishes me, considering where we are. Right. You know. Well, well do, do people always just assume that you're on their side? Yeah, they do. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. So is that just is that a, a part of an occupational thing, or do you think it's just your own your own kind of persona, or what is it? But yeah, well, uh, it's a, it's a couple of things. I mean, one, having worked in PR for a long time, I'm just kind of a natural diplomat because if a client says something, you kind of have to agree, and if you don't agree, you have to disagree very, very civilly. Secondly, it, it doesn't help my tips any to argue with someone at the bar, right. and that's the bottom line for me at this point. You know, I'm, um, uh, but people want to, to divulge things to their bartender; they want to have a good time. So it's, I'm, and I'm certainly not going to dissuade them from doing it. It doesn't cost me anything right, right. To, to be non-committal in, in what I say back, mm -hmm. and, it, and it benefits my bottom line. So, yeah. Well, so let me ask you. I mean, you're, um, I guess. What's your assessment of what's been happening in the country over the last four years? I mean, part, I guess that's in part, it's an Obama question. What's your assessment yeah. of, of, you know, how he has tried to steer us through this, through the crisis? Um, and then the second part of the question is really kind of, what's your expectation? What, what happens next, do you think? Uh, that's changed a great deal from before all this started. But, but first about uh, the president. Um, I wrote, I remember, after the president was elected, I was talking to a friend of mine who works on, on, on Wall Street, but who's a Democrat. And uh, he was, hey, what's up? Sorry. That's um, right. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. How you doing? Sorry, good, good. How's it going? All right. Okay. Sorry, I'm doing an interview for a <laughs> research project. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, here. Yeah, it's okay. I'll talk to you in a couple minutes. Um, yeah, when, so when Obama was, was first elected in, in 2008, I, uh, uh, and I, I had this friend, and he said, you know, uh, Obama should really try to work with the Republicans to come up with, with, with some kind of roadmap for the future to fix the economic problems. And I, of course, I had the exact opposite response. So that, to be fair, that's where I'm going to be coming from with all this. I, I remember writing this long, like, impassioned email about how it's time for Obama to be FDR. We'll never have an opportunity like this again. Um, and, and, and so I was a little disappointed that that's not what he did. I was a little disappointed at the people he appointed to help him oversee the economy, because they seem to come from the same old, uh, the same old place that, that everybody always does. Um, that said, given the environment that the president has, looking back on it, I don't know how much more he could have done. The Republicans blocked him at every turn. Um, I had hoped, like some, I was, I'd hoped at first, since he had the people's will, or people were generally un genuinely unnerved. You know, he had that FDR moment where if he had really seized it as a populist and said, we're going to make some fundamental changes in the way this country works, he could have gotten the popular support and he could have steamrolled the Republicans. Possibly. Possibly not. I mean, you know, the, the same thing I was saying about PR changing with social media is affecting politics uh, in exactly the same way. It, everything is out there instantly. And, and, and all these stupid distractions and, and 
people making silly mistakes that, that become the, the, the issue of the day. You know, maybe not, nothing the president could have done would have uh, really galvanized that public opinion. So I was a little disappointed. That said, um, and just just as part of that, you know, uh, uh, that said, the president then went and, and saved the auto industry. Um, at the you know, um, I, I wish he had he had done it in a slightly different way. I wish he had worked with the unions more um, to to uh, to benefit the workers a little bit better. But um, uh, but my my views have certainly changed from from where I was to now, um, uh, in the sense that the. The, uh, I think I understand uh, better than I did then what the president had to deal with in this economy, how complicated it is, how it's a global economy, and there's only so much that the president can do to change the unemployment picture, to change the economic picture. Um, I, I still wish he had led a little bit more um, from uh, just from a sort of a, a symbolic standpoint, saying I'm going to stand with the people, not the banks, mm -hmm. not the money and interests and that we are going to make some fundamental change because it doesn't feel like there's been any fundamental change. It doesn't feel like people have been held to task or that this couldn't happen again. It feels like it could easily happen again next year. Um, and, and I think all of this stuff ties into kind of what, what, I, what I see at the bar, what I hear from my friends about the way that people are feeling, that rather than us coming together to try and prevent something like this from happening again, that we're just entrenching ourselves in our little positions because we're all insecure and sort of firing catapults over the walls. Um, and I, I don't know if the president could have done more to break down those walls. Uh, I, I, I had hope that he would mm -hmm. in 2008. I've seen, though, how intransigent the Republicans have been and how, you know, during the primaries and what, what Mitt Romney's been saying is, is, is let's go back to the way things were before 2008. And the president is saying, well, let's, let, let's not, but I don't really want to... Uh, let's not go back to 1933. <laughs> exactly. Let's not go back to 1933. Yeah. And um, and part of that is pragmatism. And he's. I think the president is ultimately a pragmatist, not an idealist. Um, Did that surprise you, or does that surprise you about him? I mean, after the 2008 election. In retrospect, it shouldn't have, because you know, reading about it at the time, he was a very pragmatic politician always. Um, you know, going back to when he was in Harvard, and and, and uh, you know, there's a lot is made about his race and, and that. Uh, as a mixed race guy, and, and uh, uh, he kind of can, can see a lot of different sides of things. And also, as, as someone who's perceived by society as a black man, he has to be very careful with the way that he presents himself. And I, and I can see all of that. And of course, the older you get, the more you realize that everybody is much more driven by their own emotional issues mm -hmm. than they are by anything else. When you're a kid, you think everybody, you know, all the adults have, really have it together. And you, you understand much later that they don't. They're hanging on as, as, right. as by their fingernails as much as you are. Um, so uh, I think I, sh I did get my hopes up, and I probably uh, should have known better. I mean, certainly I still believe the president is, is the lesser of the two evils, and I believe he genuinely does want good things for this country. Um, I don't have stars in my eyes any anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but I wish him well. I will support him. I'll do everything I can. And, and who knows? There is a part of me that says, well, maybe in the second term he'll be freed up a little bit. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, what, yeah. what, 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 Well, first of all, do you think he's going to win? I think it'll be close, but I think he will, um, barring anything unforeseen happening, anything crazy. Um, you know, uh, but that said, I never saw, uh, you know, uh, before the debates, of course, uh, George W. Bush was uh, behind Al Gore back in, in uh, 2000. And, uh, and he came back just like Romney has. And, you know, right now we're, we're after the, just after the second debate, where the president did a lot better than the first debate. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that'll help. Um, but I'm not 100% sure, but I do think the president will win. I do hope he wins very much. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, in what, what, what would you expect in a second term from him? That's a great question. Um, I would like the president to do more in the way of financial regulation. Um, sensible financial regulation, stuff that will protect homeowners, stuff that will protect people who use credit cards, debit cards, and have bank accounts from, um, from the kind of things that, ha the kind of abuses that happened in the past. Um, I'd like to see uh, him continue with, with the health care reform. Um, 
and I'd like to see him present a better case for the health care reform. I mean, all of the things, when, as you probably know, when you tell people the individual elements of, of Obamacare, as they call it, they love it, but ask them in general about Obamacare and somehow they don't like it. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, the, the president's job, which I think he forgot during the first debate, is to sell this stuff. Right. He has to be a PR guy, yeah. not just an administrator or a, a, a negotiator. I'd like to see the uh, president uh, do more to support the middle class. And I know that's like a big, a big issue, a big um, kind of a vague thing. And I, I wish I could, I could, I could frame it more clearly. But um, it, it, it does feel like the, the two ends are squeezing the middle. That the rich get richer and the poor have more of a safety net. And then you know, folks uh, sort of in the middle, like most of us. Um, don't have much to hang on to, and that, that's very disorienting. You know, when you when you sort of expected your life to go a certain way, and then you're finding that you're just kind of looking for handholds anywhere you can find them. Um, in general, I do think um, a lot of us are going to end up having three or four jobs uh, that are all part time without any um, uh, safety, without any you know, without insurance or and, and all the other things that come with that that, that my dad took for granted when when he had the same job for 40 years. And I think the president has to address that. I think the government has to find a way to, uh, and I know this will be hard with, with the current atmosphere, but, but find a way to, to, to get us a little bit more security so we're not jumping from tree to tree all the time, um, trying, trying to, to survive. Um, and I think that problem is only going to get worse with the younger generation because uh, there, there's this. Uh, we we uh, had I had mentioned to you another time about uh, cognitive dis dissonance, and I think um, I had said you know cognitive dis dissonance is uh, quoting somebody. It's like a, a smoker who buys a lottery ticket. You know, you're ignoring the the, the 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 odds that are much more likely to, to affect you. And when I talk to young people, they uh, all think nearly to a person they're going to be rich and famous. That's why they're all always posing on Facebook, you know, like, like this and, and looking like celebrities. And they all expect that to happen very quickly. Or they think they'll be entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and the truth is they'll probably go from two to three year stints at different companies for the rest of their lives, never having any kind of security. Um, and that's a new, a new phenomenon in this country. And I think the political parties, is, you know, I think the president has to figure out a way to deal with that, to not only to... If, he's going to, if the Democrats are going to stick around to appeal to those people, who kind of all see themselves as entrepreneurs. As a side note, I had a, a, a friend of my girlfriend's uh, told me she admired the Kardashians. And I said, oh my God, that somebody my age is like, they're revolting. Why do you revire, uh, admire them? And she said, well, because they're really good at building their brand. <laughs> there you go. Well, so, I mean, is, is, is this the thing that makes... A, a Romney candidacy even viable is like this broad sense of kind of entrepreneurialism and I'm going to be in the one percent and yeah I, I do I do I think it's all BS um, it's that cognitive dissonance you know I think I'm going to win the lottery even though I'm not, and not be killed by the cigarettes mm -hmm. um, yeah and, and I think that the Republicans and Romney is especially good at appealing to that sense that, that I'm eventually going to be you know through my hard work and and effort and creativity and ingenuity, I'm eventually going to be one of these these wealthy folks, so I better start protecting myself now. Or it's just the way things are. We're all in a, shank, a shark tank, and we've all got to fight for the scraps that are around. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if that's the case, then you know you just want your taxes to be as low as possible, and the government to get out of your way so you can crush all of your competition. And um, it's like it's like you know the United States is a reality show. And I'm not here to make friends. They all say, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think a society functions well that way. Yeah, I think okay. you need to make friends. You need to make relationships. I mean, the, the best things about America are that we pull together in, in times of crisis. That um, there's always been these like church groups and social organizations, the kind of stuff that Obama did when he was yeah. a community organizer that they so derive. Right. I mean, those are the kind of things that, that we, we really do have to, uh, that are falling apart, I think, by the wayside. And, that, and we have to foster not just... You know, the old school organizations that are there, or government organizations, or private organizations, but that sense that we all need to take care of each other. Mm -hmm. You know, that sense that it's important for, for us to look after our neighbors, and, and not just, you know, step on them to get to the, to the diminished uh, dollar that's around. Yeah. I'm going to come back to class politics in a second, but let, let me just ask, how important do you think that race is in 
to the to the 2012 to this election. election. Yeah. Um. Well, I guess it depends how old you are. I think it's it's much less important to younger folks um, who who don't even, uh, in my experience anyway, with people who are sort of under 30, is that is that race is, race is much less of an issue. Now, I don't, I doubt they're going to decide the election. I mean, allegedly everybody's going after the, the, the undecideds. Um, and I, I, I do see uh, so a lot of that anger that I was talking about. I see uh, in in guys my age or older, you know, sort of like white males. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and uh, there's, you know, when you go around, there's tons of, uh, if you ever look at um, comments, to like there's a video on YouTube and there's a bunch of comments. I can't read those. They're awful. They're horrible. They're just full of seething racism and, and, and homophobia and, and, um, and, and hatred of women. And, and that seems to be, if people have anonymity, that seems to be, you know, their first response to things, their first emotional response. I can't believe that ends online. I mean, I really think that, that uh, these coded messages that, that some politicians send are intentional. Um, and, and, yeah, you know, and that, that's not going to stop because everybody, I think, relies on their emotions for their political views first. You kind of you figure out how you feel and then you find ways to justify that in your political beliefs. Um, and so if you're at, at heart, whether you want to admit it to a pollster or not, or you want to admit it to your family or friends or not, if you are frightened of somebody of a different race, it's going to come out. And you'll probably just find a more socially acceptable way to, to show it. Um, so I think among older people, there, there's going to be a percentage who won't vote for Barack Obama because he's a black man. Um, and there'll be, uh, especially among older folks, and, and there'll be uh, certainly be folks who won't vote for Mitt Romney because he's a Mormon. And, for, and lots of people who, who will not vote for someone for a very emotional reason. Um, I think it's, it's a hump the president has to get over. There, I think there's a percentage of the population that will not vote for him no matter what, no matter how much he appeals to their economic interests. You know, that's the whole like Reagan Democrat thing. Mm-hmm. That's been around for a long time, where the, the, you know, the Southern strategy that Nixon had in the 1970s to gin up uh, racial uh, animosity to separate Democrats from, you know, uh, the, 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 the se- separate Southern Democrats from the Democratic Party. That's still going on. It's just much, much subtler now right. because it's too easy to get caught. Right. So, Although, you know, did you, I don't know if you saw Sununu's comments the other day. I didn't. After know. the first, it was actually after the first debate. He said, he said um, that Obama is lazy, and that's why he did so poorly. And then the, whoever was interviewing him asked. Um, well, do you think he'll be better prepared? And he said, well, he's really not very bright. And so his, the amount that he'll be able to prepare is really limited. Wow, that's hardly so at all. No. And, and somebody called him the food stamp president recently? Right. Or? Gingrich started that in the, yeah. pri- in the primaries. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I, I, as, well, probably as we get closer to the election, they'll be less and less subtle about it. Because yeah. Yeah. There's, there's less of a time for backlash, you know. That's, yeah, that's right. You know, nobody, after, the day after the election, nobody would care what anybody had said the day before. So, um, I was going to kind of loop back to the class politics dimension of this. First of all, I was really, I was interested in your talking about unions. Nobody talks about unions anymore. I mean, they just don't and haven't, you know, really since the Reagan years. Um, And the the decline in unionism has just been so steep. Um, Did you grow up in a union family? Uh, My my dad's a teacher. Mm -hmm. So... uh, so yeah, he was in the teachers' union. My mom was not. She was a social worker. But I was always interested in unions. So when I was in college, I was on the um, the contract negotiating committee for AFL CIO two seventeen. I still remember it because <laughs> I was really excited about it, uh-huh. uh, and it was a really interesting experience. Um, I, I I remember after the negotiation where where, where the company uh, the, it was for the cafeteria workers, and I was a cafeteria worker. And after the company, which through all the negotiations said we were essentially breaking them, and we were, we were like, you know, how could we do this? We're going to destroy the company. Uh, we, we negotiated, we came, we finished a contract, and, and one of the uh, negotiators for the company said, came over to me and said, man, you guys got rolled over. I, went, I was 21, I, I, and I, I, I what, really? Oh, you know how much? I, he was probably full of it, but he said, oh, we were, we were willing to give you like 15% more. You guys just rolled over on it. This is great. I can't wait to go back and tell the folks at the corporate headquarters what, what patsies you guys are. And, and whether he was lying or not, it, it really affected my worldview. Mm-hmm. 
because I honestly thought everybody at, at 21, everybody or 20, everybody was going into this with an open mind. And, and I didn't realize how adversarial the process was. And in talking to, uh, to the folks in the union at the time, and again, it, it, it informed me of a lot of stuff. They said, no, you have to understand, this is antagonistic negotiation. People are going to lie, they're going to cheat, they're going to push against you. And, uh, and of course, unions did that a little too much and got a little too greedy, I think, over the course of history. But there was a time when, you know, my grandfather uh, on my dad's side was in a union, and uh, he worked in a factory, you know, in a bean canning factory, and um, uh, he had job security, he had health care, he had um, a support system among the union itself, and uh, again, the kind of dislocation that all my friends feel, I'm 49 years old, uh, people my age and a little bit younger, where there's, there's none of that, you're terrified to get sick. You think you could lose your job any second now. Um, and, and, and if you do, especially if you're in a big city like New York City, you kind of feel alone. There's no mm -hmm. union hall to go to where you could talk to counselors or talk to uh, people. I mean, there's some resources in the city, but, but that, that uh, is a last resort. Um, and I kind of, uh, and I just see things going more and more that way, and nobody's screaming about it. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody cares. It, it is, and especially younger folks just see that as the way of the world. Everybody is an entrepreneur. Everybody's a shark in the tank, and, and it didn't used to be that way. All the great jumps in America's living standards came because of unions. The middle class was created because of unions, and everybody seems to have forgotten it. Mm -hmm. Unions are, what are they now, 10%, less than 10%? Yeah, of the, I think 10, 10 or 12, I think, yeah. Yeah, of the workforce. Um, and, and we've just we've kind of lost the American dream when, when, we, when unions have essentially disappeared or, or, or irrelevant for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and even just the threat of unions was important because you know employers would give people stuff to avoid mm -hmm. them from unionizing. Now you don't have to do that anymore. And in fact, more and more folks my age I see are working like me, you know, part time consulting because it's a hell of a lot cheaper, but it's a hell of a way to make a living. Yeah. What's your sense of the Occupy movement and what they did or did not accomplish and, and where they went? I mean, what's your understanding of what we, what we saw between, you know, September of, of 2011 and, and this fall? How do you understand everything that happened? I, I went down there for a little bit of that, and, and I was, uh, unfortunately, I think the perception that people who were knocking it gave it was the perception I got, maybe because I'm, I'm an older guy and a New Yorker, but it did seem to be too diffuse. Uh, there were, you know, there were people campaigning for trans transgender rights, which is I think, a fine, valid issue, but you know, it was just this giant carnival of people with a lot of different issues. Um, it wasn't just about the economy, and there was no sort of main leadership, it seemed to me, that had a specific set of demands. It was great to draw attention to the problem, but in the end, I don't really think it helped very much at all, mm -hmm. um, just because it was uh, too much of a drum circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, but we do have we do have the first election cycle in forty years or more in which economic inequality is actually at least True. it's being discussed. True. Now, how that translates into policy changes is hard to know. You know whether that can turn into you know turning around the the long decline of the union movement or or whatever. You know there are a number of ways that that just the consciousness of, of that inequality could change our, our politics and our policy. Um, are, you, are you at all hopeful of that, or does it just seem like that moment kind of passed and, and nothing really is happening? A, a little. I think, it is, I think it will have to happen because of the way society is now, and I was, uh, in a weird way, encouraged that uh, Mitt, Mitt Romney was at least paying lip service to that at the, at the second debate. Um, but... Uh, The, um, it's, it's a really interesting question because you're right it, it's, it's on the radar more than ever but it, it doesn't seem um, I haven't heard a lot of good prescriptions for solutions you know, there's a lot of talk about it and if, you, and if you look at the flip side I mean Romney's still talking the same old just deregulate and lower taxes and everything's going to be fine it got us into trouble in the first place right. and he's pulling almost 50% exactly. on that line, which is shocking to me but I, you know what do I know? Yeah, if there's one thing we, we, the country should have learned from 2008, it's certainly not that we need less financial regulation. 
Mm-hmm. It is interesting. I mean, you, something you were saying a little while ago about the potential in the in the second Obama term that you know if he wins, he's winning without Wall Street. Yeah, and maybe he will feel freed up this time to really go after that kind of regulation in a way that he didn't the first time. Because no, yeah. he won with Wall Street the first time. That's right. Um, and, and if he's really alienated Wall Street as much as you know the press would have us believe. Um, well, I just interviewed someone from Wall Street a week ago, and oh, I, can, yeah. I can my my sample of one <laughs> tells me <laughs> that he really alienated Wall Street. So yeah, well, so that that could happen, or he could you know fight to get back in their good graces too. He could do that, and right, and the Clinton wing of the party would probably really urge him to do that as well. Yeah, I'll, it would be great if he made some kind of bold statement, assuming he was reelected at the beginning of his term. You know, maybe uh, disavowing the Clinton wing of the party, you know, going sort of like the the Reich way or something like that, like uh, getting somebody who's who's more toward uh, toward that end of the party to to be a secretary, you know, to be a treasury secretary or something something interesting like that. Or just to make a bold statement about what he wants to do mm-hmm. um, uh, during his inauguration. Um. Yeah. I want to come back to the the kind of unedgedness of the society and that you were describing that you see even in the bar, um, but just the sense of the just the tension and the. I mean, I feel on edge myself, but mm-hmm. just the. Um, beyond polarization now. I mean, we've been polarized since the 90s, basically, but now it's like this kind of demonization that is, is really, um, it's extreme. Can you imagine us, I mean, the, the 2000 election was, was bad enough, but if something like that were to happen in 2012, where there was a contested election, or one side or another felt that, felt that, um, that the election had been stolen, or that it was being lost on like you know, voter, voter suppression, split, split, or there yeah. was a procedural things like the hanging chads, or whatever it was. As a society, could we survive that in 2012? Boy, um, I, it would be a pressure cooker. I don't know. Um, yeah, if we had a, a 2000 again, wow. I mean, one of the, the if there was any good thing about. Uh, you know, 9-11, it kind of brought everybody back together again after all that divisiveness. Um, and, and without that, yeah, I, I think it would it would really fracture society if that were to happen again and really cause a lot more disentrenchment um, and a lot more uh, naked aggression, which, I, you know, again, I, I, from my perch as a bartender, I see a lot. I stop people from talking about politics because I know exactly where it's going to go. Right. Does it ever literally get scary? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I've had people walk out because, um, you know, I might be, be talking to one customer, I think, quietly about my own politics, which you got a, you got a sense of, and somebody overhears and will just jump in without an invite and say, that's bullshit, I was watching Glenn Beck, and he said... Um, and then uh, and, and storm out, not leave a tip, you know, just barely pay their tab. That's happened to me a couple of times. Uh, I had, uh, I put the, I think I mentioned before, I put the Democratic National Convention on because I had bar, some folks at the bar who wanted to watch it and put the sound up very quietly. Um, they wanted to see Bill Clinton speak. I had one table in the whole restaurant, it was, it was 10 o'clock at night or, or whatever, and that one table, the person at it, stood up and yelled, turn that goddamn asshole off. I'm trying to have dinner. The one table that was here. So I had to turn the volume down and disappoint all ten people at the bar who wanted to. And, and again, this is the Upper West Side of Manhattan, not Mississippi. It's strange. And I see a lot of, uh, you know, New York is, is not a, a, a very polite place. But having been here 20-some years, it, 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 feels a, it feels less polite than it's ever been and less uh, accommodating. Um, it's still better than most people imagine it. Visitors are always surprised when they come to the city that the people are as, as friendly and welcoming, and I think that's true. But among ourselves, when I, I interact with people, I find a kind of, uh, it's a fear. It feels much more like a fear and an insecurity, really, than anger. But um, there's a definite, like, I'm holding on to what I have feeling, and, um, and I'm angry with you for trying to get it, which is, feels like something new to me, mm-hmm. uh, at least as in this, in the kind of severity that we see it. Um, sitting right at this table where we're sitting right now, I had a, a customer sitting in this seat. Um, he was uh, bow tied, 
uh, I found out later he had one of those black cards, one of those wonderful credit cards. And uh, he was with a couple of friends, and, and I, I was looking at the wine list, and he really couldn't decide. He asked me to recommend a few things, which I did. And uh, I was behind the bar. It was a very busy night. And I said, why don't I give you a couple of minutes? I'll be right back. And he screamed at me and poked his finger in my chest and said, don't you fucking go anywhere. I have a few more questions. And uh, this continued. He was this way through, like, the entire, the entire meal. I'd never seen that before. I hadn't, and certainly, you know, back in the 80s when I was bartending back then, you never saw something like that. And he was just that, that way, fist pounding and, like, you're my, you're a servant. You know, you better listen to me through the entire meal. Uh, eventually, he ordered, like, a $50 uh, glass of scotch. He said, I better pour it right, just right for him with two ice cubes. And then, you know, left me a 10% tip. And he walked out. I was surprised I got any kind of a tip. Uh, you know, there's, there's that's one end of it. Mm -hmm. And then, then there's then I also have have customers who are just absolutely furious at, at uh, uh, the I think overly furious at anybody who shows any sign of any kind of success. So I don't think that's good either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll have some some nice people who I know who live around here who might might, might be dressed well and clearly like very professional and. Somebody who's blue collar at the bar will go, hey, where did those jerks come from? You know, I, I, I'm as, as polite as I can be, but I, I know that they're nice people. They just happen to, you know, have a Cadillac Escalade, <laughs> you know, that they got into. But yeah, that annoys people. It's interesting. Uh, I, I often walk to work by Columbia, the prep school up the street. Uh -huh. And it is, and you can tell, you can kind of tell people's class because, of, or people's political views, because if you walk past there at two in the afternoon when I do, or three, when people are picking up their kids, it's Escalade, 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 Prius, <laughs> Escalade, 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 beat up Ford, Escalade, 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 <laughs> Lexus, you know. Again, that's the Upper West Side. But yeah, yeah. So how now, having been a Underemployed and working at the bar for four years. How do you think about your own prospects, and how do you how do you plan? Like, what's your? Um, I've kind of given up the idea now that I'm pushing fifty of ever working, you know, for a, a company again. Um, mostly, I think I'll I'll work project to project. Uh, I'll try and do things like bartend when I can until I can't do it anymore because you can't do that when you're seventy. Not as much anyway, um, and maybe I just hope I'll get lucky and, and you know eventually do some kind of writing or pitching or marketing project for someone who will say, "Hey, we're going to put you on full time, part time, mm -hmm. um, and, and you can or we'll have you you know telecommute from home and, and you can you can do a considerable amount of work for us." But I'll never have I'll never make the money. I don't think I'll ever have the living standard I had in 2008, and um, and I know a lot of friends in the same position. Um, the only people who were safe were the people who had, I, I, at least in my experience, who had gotten up to the really high levels where you're kind of, uh, you have a particular set of skills and a, and a kind of a safety that, that most people don't have. Anybody beneath that um, has, is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be just scrambling uh, unless we get lucky. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think will happen to me. Um, unless the mega millions come in. Mm -hmm. well, there's always that lottery ticket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you feel like we should have? Or? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't want to sound so discouraged. I just think it's a. Uh, um, it's it's the way things are. I hope the president can change it. I hope somebody in, in the future is going to figure out a way to um, to provide us with a little more security in life. Um, I don't see it. I mean, look what's happening in Europe. You know, they're going the opposite direction with all the with all the austerity, and, and they needed to. You know, they needed to do some things. But um, as always, we tend to go in one direction or the other. Um, either uh, unions are full of excesses, or we completely destroy the unions mm -hmm. over the course of twenty years. You know, mm -hmm. um, but but maybe things will turn around. Maybe. Um, Maybe there'll be more opportunities uh, in the next ten years. I don't know. I just see everything fragmenting, and I think, I, if I'm honest with myself, I think all of us will continue to scramble and run around and pick up little pieces, you know, and that, or most of us will. 
except for the lucky few who you know are, are at the top and do get out of Harvard Law or Harvard Business School or, 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 or anything else. But those of us who are sort of like in the middle um, are going to continue to to have to uh, or, you know uh, run around um, looking for direction and, and, and looking for ways to survive. Uh, unless there's unless there's a comeback of unions, um, unless some kind of new innovation comes in that completely changes things like, like the internet did mm -hmm. um, and, and offers more opportunities for people uh, for people to make a living. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that, that, that it's possible. I'm hopeful I'll, I'll do okay. I'll, I'll survive. I think, I mean, God knows, uh, you know, bartending and, and being a, a writer during the day, there are many worse ways to go. My dad used to lay asphalt. Occasionally guys would pass out and fall face down in the asphalt and get burned. Um, th that's not what I'm doing. I'm very lucky. I, I'm much luckier than a lot of people, and I do understand that. Um, but I don't expect in the near future things will get any better for me. Mm -hmm. Is it conceivable to you that we can, as a country, as a society, redevelop a kind of language of commonality that you were talking about having just been eviscerated over the last generation or two. I think I that's mean, the most important thing. Yeah. And, and can that be done? It could be. You, you know, the, our means of communication are so... Uh, it's still new. We're still figuring out what all of this stuff means. And it's still changing all the time. Uh, you know, but, but that's been true in a lot of periods of history and then things settle down and everybody figures out what they need to do. Mm -hmm. I hope we can do that. I, I mean, I, I know this is very vague, but, but I don't know, I, I had no idea what was, where I would be five years ago when I was making six figures and running a PR firm office. I had no idea I'd be here. I never saw this coming. And I certainly can't see where, what's going to be happening in the next five years. It's entirely possible that we'll, that we'll find a way to use all these new technologies and, the, and all the ways that society is changing to, uh, to get a new common language and, and a common purpose and come together. Maybe that's the ultimate purpose of all this stuff. Um, I think if you talk to somebody, you know, some social utopian, utopian in, the, in the 19th century and told them there would be this ability for people to have instant access to communication, instant access to information, to be able to talk to people all over the world, they would have thought it was a dream world come true. But it hasn't turned out that way. But maybe it can eventually. Maybe if we, if we figure out what it all means and stop being kind of caught off base by it, we can pull, we can pull it all together. I hope so. Mm -hmm. It's sobering. I just, um, you know, last week or so was the, the anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. And, and so there was a lot of talk about it and on TV and the radio. And um, one commentator, I can't remember who it was, said, you know, that if that, if they, if, 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 Kennedy and Khrushchev had stared each other down in that circumstance in an, an environment like ours with new media, they would have blown each other up. That's true. Because the yeah. only thing that saved them was they each had like a 24-hour cycle to kind of think about things and figure right. out. It was like a chess game. And they could keep things secret. And they could keep things totally secret. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, talking to the Russian ambassador and all that crazy skullduggery that went on. It could never happen today. It would instantly be posted on, on you know, on Facebook. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time oh, and your generosity. Not at all. Happy to do it. 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 Do it.